Hello everyone, thanks for watching this video. This is a uh, poster presentation that I presented uh, at the SEG Denver 2014. Uh, the title of this presentation is Computation of Quasi-P and Quasi-Shear Wave Rays, Travel Time, Slowness Vector, and Polarization in General Anisotropic Media. This is our first attempt to anisotropy, so for now we're only interested in the kinematic information that include the travel time, rays, lobus, and a polarization. The shear wave splitting is also modeled by calculating the first arrival of fast shear wave and the slow shear wave. Um, hopefully in our second uh, step we're going to include some dynamic information such as the amplitude, but for now this poster is about uh, the kinematic information uh, calculation in the general anisotropic media. As you can see here, this poster has two parts basically. The first part uh, is the uh, mathematical uh, uh, theory. As far as we know, uh, this method is actually the first and the fast implementation of calculating the Econo equation in a general anisotropic media for both P and S wave. Um, the th mathematical theory lays the foundations of this technique, so I call them uh, the fine prints, um, because the terms and conditions of using these techniques are there. The second part is about validation and, uh, and applications, and I'll show you this method has first order accuracy and it can produce reproduce what is uh, predicted by the theory. Uh, it has many applications, for example, it can be applied in migration, seismic imaging, and uh, travel time tomography, as long as you need to incorporate uh, an isotropy in your case. In Atasca, we are interested in uh, characterizing the hydraulic fractures that is induced in a shell reservoir by analyzing the shear wave splitting. So at the end, I'll just show you the potential and the benefits of this technique in shear wave analysis and a fracture characterization. So, in uh, an isotropic media, to calculate the travel time, we usually have to introduce some approximations or simplifications like weak anisotropy or use the perturbation theory. But even with simplifications, the calculation for the shear wave uh, direct arrival is not uh, straightforward because the two shear waves are coupled and split at the same time. And mathematically, at least one of the shear wave has uh, the, the slowly surface of the shear wave is concave. And most of the conventional techniques rely on the convexity of the uh, of the Econo equation. So we need to find a different technique that can solve the Econo equation without assuming the convexity. In other words, so these techniques can be uh, applied to both P and S wave. The algebra here is just want to show you the analytical expression. The exact analytic expression for uh, only exist for isotropic and transversal isotropic media. The benefits of having an analytical expression of the Econo equation is that we can directly discretize the Econo equation and then solve for the travel time field. Uh, but in the sense of the analytical expression, we don't have this benefit and we need to find a different technique and I'll show you here. The elastic tensor, which is a four-order tensor, can be expressed by um, a two-order tensor as a 6x6 six six symmetric matrix. And then the Christoffel matrix 3x3 three three, can be expressed by A as well as the uh, slowest vector P1, P2, and P3. Uh, the uh, Christoffel matrix has three eigenvalues and eigenvectors corresponding to P wave and the two shear wave. This equation established the relationship between the ray vector and uh, the slowest vector and the polarization. So as long as we know one, we can calculate the other two. If the media is isotropic, for example, your reservoir is populated by random cracks, the uh, Econo equation, which is the square root of the eigenvalue equals to 1, is simple and it's the same for both the shear wave, P wave, and the shear wave. The only difference is for P, you use P wave velocity. For shear wave, you use shear wave velocity. The P wave polarization is in the same direction as the ray and in the same direction as the uh, uh, the slowest. Shear wave is not uh, is coupled, it's not splitted. And the shear wave polarization is uh, orthogonal to the P wave, uh, uh, P wave polarization. The simplest anisotropic media is the transversal isotropy. And uh, the Econo equation is not simple at all. The letter L, M, and N here is just to simplify the expression, but the letters themselves are expressed, uh, are a complicated expression of A and a slowness P1, P2, and P3. For other anisotropy like orthorhombic, in the other low symmetry anisotropic media, there is no analytical expression that exists. So it actually presents a challenge to us. We, how are we going to expand 
conventional techniques like faster sweeping, faster marching method to solve, uh, you know, uh, travel time for uh, those cases. So we found this uh, Lex Frederick sweeping algorithm. According to the author, this is the first and the fast numerical implementation to solve a Connor equation in a general and isotropic media uh, for both P and S and without assuming the convexity. So it can be applied to both P and S wave. All it need it doesn't need the analytical exp expression for the Econo equation. All it needs is the uh, eigenvalue, which can be solved numerically. So here is the workflow that I modified from the author for a point source in a 3D media, and I use the cartoon here to represent the workflow in uh, in in 2D. At the location where we have the source, the travel time is usually zero, and the, the other point has no travel time, so we assign an infinitely large value. Uh, the uh, Lex Frederick sweeping algorithm goes like this. It starts from an arbitrary point and it uses its neighboring point and the current point's eigenvalue to update the travel time at the current point. And of course, those point and its neighboring point has no new information, so they stay infinity until you reach points like this. They are updated by the source. And if we sweeping in this direction, we covered this quadrant. And when we sweep backward, we're going to cover another quadrant. We sweep upward and downward, so we're going to cover the rest two quadrants. So you can see in 2D, it takes four sweeps. And in 3D, it takes eight sweeps. And after that, you cover the calculation for the entire model. Different from the classic faster sweeping method, this requires a third step, which is to enforce the boundary condition. Because if the source is inside of the model, at the edge, there should have no inflow information. The information should not come from outside. It can only come from inside, outwards. So the third step here is to enforce such a outflow only boundary conditions here. And after that, you can check if your current value and the previous iteration is the same. If it's the same, according to this criteria, it's converted. So you can output the travel time. If it's not, you repeat a second, you go through the second iteration and um, until it's converged. This mathematical expression here is just uh, uh, it just says the same thing for the boundary, uh, uh, boundary outflow condition. So this is what I call the fine prints. Um, after that, we're ready to test the accuracy and show you some of the applications. We uh, first test the accuracy against the analytical um, solution in a 2D isotropic media. So you can see the uh, the travel time is expressed as function of location x and y, and the other uh, source is located at x naught and y naught. So basically, it means um, the velocity is one. As we decrease the mesh size, as you can see here, one over twenty to one over four hundred, the maximum error defined by this equation is reducing as well. So the convergence order p defined from this equation p here is about one. So this confirms that this method is first order convergent, and if we plot the travel to, uh, the uh, uh, the error as a function of mesh size, we can see the error is reducing linearly as we reduce the mesh size. So it's a first order uh, accurate. The second issue of this technique is the stability, because the uh, the algorithm can keep sweeping and sweeping. The travel time just doesn't converge. It's more likely to occur when anisotropy is strong. So to test the stability, we de deliberately make a strong anisotropy case by adding a constant number, relatively a large constant number, to the diagonal and off-diagonal values here. So we make so this elastic tensor represent a strong triclinic anisotropy case, and we apply this technique, and actually it's converged. As you can see here, the travel time field for both P and S wave are converged, and the iso surface of P. And this is iso surface for shear wave. Uh, the value for the iso surface of P wave is different from the shear wave, so that I can keep both P and S wave in the same box. Uh, the shear wave uh, iso surface has the same value, so you can see it has a significant uh, shear wave splitting effect. And in different direction, the slipping is splitting is different. Uh, in general, the P wave shear wave has this elongated or skewed shape is because of the anisotropy, strong anisotropy. It's not spherical anymore. So now we have this travel time field. At any point within the model, we can calculate the slowness, 
vector, the ray vector, as well as the polarization. To be realistic, we repeat these, uh, this task on a weak trigonic model. So the elastic tensor, the elastic tensor now looks like this. It's just without the strong perturbation. So now this media is more close to the reservoirs that we are interested in. It's a strong, it is still strong anisotropy. It's just weak trigonic. It's the way we call it. Um, so after the calculation, you can see the P-wave isosurface elongated, but the shear wave splitting is not as obvious as that case. Um, on, the, on, on, a, on this isosurface, we calculated the polarization, slowness vector, and ray vector for P-wave and for shear wave. So in general, for P-wave, the slowness, ray vector, and uh, polarization are three different vectors. This is predicted by theory, and now it's reproduced by this technique. Um, you probably cannot see it clearly by uh, looking at the arrows. They are not identical. And for P-Wave, I just show you the angle differences for the three vectors here. They are a function of the theta, the polar angle, and uh, the phi, the, uh, the azimuth. So in general, the difference, the angle between the slowest vector and the ray vector in this case is the ma maximum. And the angle between the polarization and ray direction is minimum. So which is, this is also consistent with other people's findings that you, we can use the, uh, uh, the polarization to approximate the ray direction in uh, an isotropy case. So after a series of tests like this, we're now confident about this technique and we're ready to apply to uh, our anisotropy cases. As I said at the beginning, this technique can be applied to uh, migration, seismic imaging, travel time tomography, as long as you need to incorporate anisotropy. But at Haska, we are interested in uh, uh, characterizing the fractures that is introduced by hydraulic fracturing operation in a shell reservoir, and we are interested in how we're going to detect and characterize those fractures by analyzing the shear wave splitting and the faster shear wave polarization. So I'll conclude this poster presentation by showing you the benefits and the potential of using these techniques in shear wave splitting analysis and fracture characterization. Uh, first of all, we established, adapted this uh, rock physics model to connect the fracture density, the KC here, with the elastic tensor. And as, as expected, if we add horizontal bedding or uh, horizontal uh, fractures into a uh, isotropic medium, so the background is isotropic, it's where it's described by this elastic tensor. It will become a uh, vertical transversal isotropic media, as you can see here. The stereographs here shows you uh, the phase velocity of P wave, fast shear wave, slow shear wave, and anisotropy as a function of azimuth as well as polar. So the polar is along the radial direction. The azimuth is along this direction. Uh, along the axis, we have a, a slow a velocity, and a perpendicular to the uh, axis, we have a faster velocity. The anisotropy percentage is defined as the differences between the two shear wave, and the the black lines here are actually the horizontal component of the fast shear wave polarization, and they're used to uh, as indicate the directions of the strike of the of the cracks. And in this example, because they're horizontal and there's no strike direction, so basically the horizontal uh, polarization is in parallel with the plane. And um, it's actually the uh, the fast the faster shear wave is basically the SH wave in isotropy case. The shell reservoirs are usually uh, uh, recognized as a VTI model. It's intrinsically VTI anisotropic. So by adding vertical cracks, we're going to change it to a uh, from a VTI model to an alpha-hombic model, as you can see here, by adding 2% of crack density and by adding 10% uh, crack density. But you can see here, if we only add 2% of crack density, we don't really change much of the of the phase velocity distribution as a, as a direction. And we, we increase the crack density to 10%, we will start to see the fast shear wave polarization start to be you know, be aligned along the direction of the crack and we start to see have a strong anisotropy in this direction so this test actually demonstrate that uh, in a shell reservoir if we are using faster shear wave polarization as an indicator of the cracks it actually not very sensitive there is a threshold and the crack density has to be large enough to be detected by the faster shear wave polarization 
And this threshold actually doesn't exist in isotropic case, as you can see here. The background is isotropic, and if we add a cracks along this direction, it doesn't matter if it's 1% or 10%, you will increase the velocity in this direction and reduce the velocity in the other direction. And we'll start to align the fast shear wave polarization along uh, along the strike direction of the crack. So it's it's more sensitive in if the background is isotropic. So what if we add another cracks along this direction? So according to the elastic tensor, it actually becomes a, a VTI model. It's different from the previous VTI media. The velocity along the axis is faster and uh, in, in the direction perpendicular to the axis is minimum. So somebody called this as uh, polar anisotropy and called this HTI model as azimuth anisotropy because the anisotropy is changing with azimuth and the anisotropy is varying with the polar angle. But for cases like this, you probably think this is, uh, this is a polar anisotropy only when you see the shear wave for the fast shear wave velocity is actually changing with azimuth as well. So, I just demonstrate uh, here that the benefit of using this technique to uh, uh, to calculate the shear wave splitting and also the anisotropy. So with this technique, so you know what kind of anisotropy you're expecting and you know what to expect from the uh, faster shear wave polarization analysis. So I think I'm ready to conclude this presentation. We have developed a new fast sweeping method for anisotropic media. And we have tested and validated this uh, in, a, uh, in a multiple tests. Both P and shear wave can be uh, calculated. That include the first arrival, wave action, direction, uh, slowness vector, and the polarization. The shear wave splitting can be modeled in a heterogeneous and isotropic model with multiple sets of cracks with arbitrary orientations. If you have any questions and uh, comments about this presentation, please leave a message here or just send me, um, send me an email uh, right here. The, uh, the, uh, the abstract of this presentation can be downloaded from this link. Uh, you just need to scan the, uh, the QR code here, and you're welcome to visit the uh, ASC um, the company web page uh, by using this link. Thank you for your attention.